Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the KSL's uh, 25th anniversary KSL's SAGES Joint Symposium. I'm So Kwan Lee uh, from South Korea, and uh, my, my chair, is, uh, uh, our co chair is Dr. Uh, Leon Fredman. Ah, Leon Fredman, sorry, uh, the president of the SAGES. Uh, Dr. Fredman, please say hello to the audience. Hello, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to participate in your 25th anniversary uh, Congress today. Okay, uh, uh, this time uh, we have four speakers from uh, Korea and uh, SAGES. So uh, Dr. Feldman will introduce the SAGES member and I will introduce the Korean member. Uh, Dr. Feldman, please introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Professor Lee. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker, John Marks. Uh, Dr. Marks is the James Widner Ray Professor and Chair of Colorectal Surgery and Director of the Colorectal Surgery Center at Lankenau Medical Center in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's really one of the world's foremost experts in laparoscopic and robotic approaches to rectal cancer. Uh, he's also the chair of our oncology task force at SAGES, uh, and he's going to speak to us today on the history of sphincter preserving surgery. Play the video, please. Thank you for the opportunity to present today on the history and development of transanal sphincter preserving surgery from Tata to TATME and beyond. And it's only appropriate. The background for this is this watercolor by my father, Dr. Gerald Marks, who many of you may know as the originator of the Tata, who's the artist behind this painting of our fair city. Here are my disclosures. I'll speak to whoever wants to speak with me, most of whom are pretty nice. I hope you guys are nicer than me than these people today. Well, we've had and we're going to have a lot of great talks in this session about rectal cancer. And really the, the unifying notion is that in short, low rectal cancer surgery is difficult. And really the transanal approach to TME is a culmination of a lot of major events in the development of rectal cancer management, intertwining rectal cancer surgery, as well as minimally invasive surgery. And TATME is a way to make this surgery easier. So Sir Ernest Miles really developed the APR in the 1900s. And this has been to this day, a major staple in the care of low rectal cancers. The challenge is that it leaves you with a permanent colostomy. And to this date in America and around the world, APR rates still run as high as 50% or more. So it's really a rectal cancer renaissance in the 1980s, pioneered and headed by these three, Bill Heald, who we all know from TME, uh, Gerald Marks, who we know from the Tata, and Gerhard Boos, who we know from TEM. And personally, I've been blessed to have had significant relationships with all these people. So this is the group. And when they've come together with these issues, what the outcome of that is transanal TME. So what are the challenges? The challenges of rectal cancer surgery center around this. What is a reasonable distal margin and how do you obtain that uh, even after adjuvant therapy, neoadjuvant therapy? Can you do this avoid and permanent colostomy? And how is a complete TME accomplished? So this is a beautiful demonstration by Kuzo, a friend who was nice enough to lend this. And this is showing the critical areas. And this is what Bill Heald has really uh, pioneered and really highlighted, which is the separation of the embryologic fusion plane between the mesorectum and all the other organs as shown here, lying behind the pelvic uh, nerves, hypogastric plexus. 
So Dr. Gerald Marx uh, really spoke about the essential points of Tata saying that a known distal margin after new adjuvant therapy is what constitutes a reasonable thing. It's the issue after the treatment that's important, not where it started. And by doing this, we can expand sphincter preservation and allow for the most difficult part of the operation to be done first when we do a ta Timmy or a ta, -ta approach. So dating back to 1976, he was the first to develop sphincter preservation surgery after high dose radiation. And this was at a time when it was felt to be malpractice to perform surgery and anastomosis after radiotherapy. And he published widely in this field and really set the stage for the following developments. In 1984, the Tata was first described by Dr. Gerald Marks from his work with Mo Mahudin. And this operation in short looks like this. The operation is started at the dentate line, taken in a full thickness fashion uh, and developed up to the level of the prostate or the cervix. And this is what it looks like in the operating room. The electrocautery is used to incise at the level of the dentate line circumferentially. And the idea here is that the metamom scissors are then used to spread in a full thickness fashion through the internal sphincter, highlighting and showing here the puba rectalis. It's the shiny white of the puba rectalis as demonstrated here, which is really the highlight of this approach. And once you're there, you're in the intersphincteric plane uh, between the internal sphincter, which we remember is a continuation distally of the inner circular layer of the rectum and the puba rectalis distally. So this is what we're seeing here. We've taken this in a full thickness uh, fashion. And then using the electrocautery, we're incising circumferentially. There's a puba rectalis. And here are the, the fibers of the internal sphincter. And then this is brought around circumferentially until it's met anteriorly. And one has to be careful not to get anterior to the prostate or into the vagina, uh, not expected. So once you've freed this up fully, the rectum can be fully closed. And this is done in a watertight fashion, which has a dual purpose of avoiding soilage, so there's not fecal matter spilling into the field. And then also, which has been highlighted by the Norwegian experience, the ability to make sure that there's no cancer cells that are spread into the field. And we've written extensively about this, published uh, widely about this, and um, this has led to other uh, developments. So convergence of things, we spoke about TME and Tata, and TEM was brought into the field. And then in the MIS world, in terms of laparoscopy and single port surgery, things have come together. So personally, for me, it made sense because of my experience uh, shown here, the over 3000 cases, looking at single port laparoscopic, robotic and, uh, and multi-port laparoscopy. So, you know, the history goes back to the uh, late 80s and early 90s when Dennis Fowler and Moises Jacobs did the first colectomy. Uh, and there was opposition to multi-port laparoscopy, concerns about pneumoperitoneum forming carcinomatosis, which has been echoed more recently, as well as practical concerns as to how one would do an anastomosis in this field. Uh, Chunji Kim uh, pioneered the laptata, which he uh, referred to as the lata, uh, and myself pioneered this in terms of laparoscopic tata for dictal distal rectal cancers. These were all kind of building on each other moving forward. Gerhard Boos, on the other hand, is someone who really had disruptive change and he left us too early. He would have really enjoyed seeing and hearing what was going on. Uh, but I would say he probably felt very alone in the woods crying out. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, this is dating back to early 2000s, this is 2003. Uh, this is a video uh, which I presented at the World Congress showing laparoscopy for rectal cancer with the Tata. The dissection below has been done all in a uh, open fashion as shown. 
And then you see how quickly in opening the pouch of Douglas, how we enter into the dissection from below and uh, complete this. So we're able to perform a complete uh, laparoscopic tata. And then this is showing the empty pelvis uh, afterwards. We've done the TME and you see how things look. Now, nothing below has been done in a minimally invasive fashion, but you can see nonetheless uh, what things look like. And this is the type of response we're getting, um, complete TME. You know, so from this, from multi-port laparoscopy came single-port laparoscopy and notes. So the next thing in minimally invasive surgery was uh, SILS performed by uh, Dr. Geisler, uh, one of my, my first fellow in 2007 at the Cleveland Clinic. And then in 2004, notes appendectomy was described by Rao and Reddy. And so as these things come together, it makes some interesting questions. When you talk about notes, it's one of these things, uh, just because you can do something, doesn't make sense to do it. And in this case, I would say to you, uh, really not always. Um, but in 2009, we published this paper, does it make sense to injure a normal organ like the colon or the stomach to take out a diseased organ like the appendix or the gallbladder? At that point, I would argue to you, no. Uh, however, notes for rectal surgery is something quite different. Uh, you already have an injury in the target organ. So the early rectal cancer notes experience um, Lee Swanson and Mark Whiteford published their experience in cadavers. And then uh, Pat Sill and Dave Ratner did a much larger series. And Pat has just spoken today. And then uh, we had the first experience with doing this in a live patient, which we called the Tomata. That was combined the TEM and a uh, transanal Tata in 2008. So um, the convergence of all this is really what has led us to TEM TATA, which evolved into TATME. So this is just showing a uh, video of that case. This was someone who um, had an, a, a metastatic cancer. Uh, things were stuck from above. Uh, we did not wish to give him an APR because he'd had uh, difficulty with healing and had perineal problems. So what we elected to do was go from below, uh, do the Tata as shown, then we put the TEM in. Uh, this was really because we were stuck from above and didn't wish to uh, convert to an open case. And this was showing us finishing things. And this was a hybrid approach uh, because we had the laparoscope in from above and below. And this is what it's looking like. Uh, I can tell you I was operating kind of with my uh, uh, heart in my, in my throat. As uh, we did this, this is, you know, the two teams connecting. These are the two views. And then once we connected like that, it made it easier to uh, bring this all the way around. This is showing the view. Uh, and while we're used to seeing this today, in 2008, this was quite a uh, astonishing uh, look. And then we delivered things uh, transanally. So, um, you know, all these things together were going on. And then simultaneously in uh, Southern Florida, Matt Albert and his team with uh, Sam Mattel and Sergio LaRoche were developing TAMIS, uh, which gave a more functional approach for doing things. And then Antonio Lacey and uh, Pat Sill were able to use the TAMIS port more for top TME. And with those things together, really what's come about is the modern day top TME. And so this is kind of the timeline that we're talking about. We've gone from miles to radiation, to TME, to TEM, to TATA, to the first laparoscopic cases, and then the first laparoscopic colons, uh, lap TATA, notes, and then from there to SILS and uh, TAMATA, and then really the top TME, which we're talking about today. So. That's where we've been. We've heard some of the data in that regard, but um, you know, really to me, the issue has to do with where do we go from here? I think this is a nascent field that's growing. 
Uh, and as we expand things to a, a true notes transanally, uh, you've had um, Joelle Lois talk about doing the progress procedure that we're all aware of. Uh, we've done full tatas transanally, and Shuliard has also published his experience with things. And so this is um, what I'm talking about. We've done the whole transanal TME from below, and then here we are coming, we're flipping the um, rectum up in the abdominal cavity. We're coming in, this is with the laparoscope, uh, looking at things, incising along the line of tolt right at the pelvic brim, coming underneath the mesentery, identifying the left ureter, and this is all transanally, and we're using a flexible tip scope here. And then uh, from here, we're able to dissect up underneath the mesentery, rotating everything anteriorly, and using the ligature, uh, come across the IMA. You better make sure your ligature is working, because if you have a bleeder here, you have an issue, and you can see the IMA pulsating there. And then, um, this is showing uh, another clip of a different case, same approach. Uh, this is us taking down the uh, splenic flexure. Again, this is transanally. We're coming up along the line of tolt. And really, I'm asked all the time, do you know if you're gonna be able to do this? And the answer is no. Um, it's difficult to predict whose anatomy is gonna lend itself to this, but we try this on a regular basis. Um, and if we can mobilize things and see things, we'll do it. But you can see the spleen there. Here we are coming uh, around the splenic flexure, uh, incising the lunar renal colic uh, ligament here. And then what we're gonna do is take the mesentery off of the inferior border of the pancreas, uh, which is really essential for someone that you're going to do a choline on astomosis. And this is what we're showing here. We fully mobilize things, uh, and then we're in a position uh, to deliver things transanally uh, once that's done. So, this is just taking down uh, the final attachment to the gastrocolic ligament. You can see the posterior wall of the stomach there, and you can see how fully. Uh, the splenic flexure can be released. And then delivered for you. One has to be certain to have the, uh, the bowel mobilized and make sure the bowel itself doesn't get twisted. And for anyone interested, we've published on this a while back. So really, the Tata, I would say to you, is really the ancestor slash originator of the Tata me. And uh, we published our long-term results with this with over 300 uh, patients looking at over five years with a local recurrence rate of only 4.3% and a five-year survival of 93%. So the outcomes can be quite good. Uh, we've come forward with this. If you look at what's on the table in terms of what do we talk about, I'd say we have to talk about what defines a TA TME, um, what are the major points to it, and what can be accomplished surgically from below and what from above. We're still working on uh, standardizing things, and Pat spoke to you about the trials that are ongoing and the functional outcomes. There's a lot of data that's come to light with this, uh, but clearly this is feasible and safe. And I think that carcinomatosis and pelvic infection can clearly be avoided with good technique. Uh, we've just not seen the data that uh, the, the Norwegian group has spoken about. Um, and again, this is a shameless uh, uh, advertisement for our book from a couple years ago that has a lot of great uh, data in this regard. Um, I would say to you that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as being self-evident. 
You know, in terms of what's coming in the future, I would say that the effectiveness of any surgical operation has to do with how it can be performed, not only by one surgeon, but by many surgeons. And so any technology which reduces the technical difficulty in the execution of an operation will automatically increase its effectiveness and indirectly benefit patient care. Uh, and so I would say to you, the SP robot helps with that. And for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Uh, four arms coming through a 25 millimeter canister uh, that have the ability of wristed movement and motion and uh, articulation circumferentially around the field uh, as shown here. Uh, this is what the external view of this looks like at the bedside. Uh, this is coming in transanally. You can see you have the ability to rotate and control the camera and three arms transanally. And this is what this looks like uh, in the patient. This is a uh, TATME with the SP robot. Um, here are the arms that come in. They break at the elbow and then at the wrist. This is showing um, the dissection that's carried out. It's worth looking down here at the six o'clock position. One can see this hologram, which tells you the orientation of the uh, arms as you dissect. And this is showing the three arms tending this up in the air, giving us the ability to dissect out in that plane between the mesorectum and the endopelvic fascia. Here we're coming anteriorly and then entering into the perineal cavity. And what you see here is what we're accustomed to uh, using the robot is the dexterity and wristed movement that allows uh, the fine angulation to get to difficult areas in the pelvis uh, with the tight angles. And this is the uh, sharp dissection that's being carried out. And this is for all of us, we recognize these same planes that we see in TME surgery, open or laparoscopically. These are the fine, quote, angel hairs that are uh, seen and dissected free. And this is brought around. Again, if you look at the hologram below at six o'clock in the middle, you can see the orientation of both the camera and the three arms that are being used for rotation and uh, retraction. And here we are coming up into the abdominal cavity and taking at a look from above, at above from below. You know, this is a, uh, a video of us dissecting out the IMA. And in this particular case, we had left things attached laterally. We're coming not in a medial lateral, but an inferior to superior approach in the same plane that you dissect medial laterally. We've identified the left ureter. And the third arm allows you to retract things up. And you can see how clearly this can be seen, how nicely this can be seen. And here we are coming around circumferentially the IMA. You can see we have a high ligation. You can see the hypogastric nerves there posteriorly. And then unfortunately, a significant drawback to date for the SP robot is there is no uh, vessel sealer or stapler or suction evolved. So we're taking the IMA with a clip in this uh, case. You can see how far we're coming. Uh, this is a neat feature allowing all the instruments and the camera to be moved as a single unit. And here we are now picking things up and uh, controlling the vessel. We're double clipping the uh, aortic side and then transecting afterwards. It's always a good idea to cut things a little bit at half. So if you have bleeding, you would see it. But as this is completely transected, you can see this pulsating uh, from above. Uh, this is just a little picture of me being happy to accept our SP robot here a few years ago. And then we've uh, had the opportunity to publish uh, thoroughly 
uh, on our experience uh, with this. And I'm sure many more publications from around the world will be following uh, shortly. So to conclude, what I'd say is that as technology improves, clearly so will our desire as surgeons to use it. Uh, this is really a man, Gerhard Boos, that all of us uh, owe a tremendous amount to. He's the visionary who developed TEM surgery at the time before laparoscopy. And it'd be amazing to see what he'd be doing with everything today. This is only the early stages of innovation. There's a uh, great deal of intelligent technology and artificial intelligence that we'll see. This is showing uh, image overlay uh, for robotic cases. And what I would say to you is that uh, Todd TME is uh, a path to notes, perhaps. Uh, but notes really is a journey, not necessarily a generation, a destination. And uh, on that destination, uh, to that destination, the SP robot's a nice ride. So um, uh, I put a lot of these thoughts into this editorial if you're interested. I'll just leave you with this quotation from Winston Churchill. It's better to take change by the hand than have it take you by the throat. And I'd like to uh, thank Sages and K-Cells uh, for the opportunity to spend this time with you. Thanks, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. John. Uh, it's a wonderful video. So uh, right now, uh, actually, uh, we will have the Q&A session after three talks because the three talks are very similar. So we will invite you uh, after three talks. Is that okay, Professor Perfect. John? Thank you. I look okay. forward to hearing the other speakers. Okay. Thank you for, uh, for the support. So it's my pleasure really to introduce Professor Patricia Silla, um, who's uh, Associate Professor of Surgery at ICANN School of Medicine and Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. She's the chair of the SAGES uh, Colorectal Surgery Committee. Um, and as we heard, was one of the early uh, innovators and developers of, uh, of these techniques and has undertaken much of uh, some, uh, some important uh, comparative effectiveness and outcomes research and is going to talk to us about the current status of TATME for rectal cancer. Hi everyone, I'm Pat Sala from New York City and it is a real pleasure to participate in this session and I thank the moderators for this very exciting session on rectal cancer. Uh, the focus of my talk is going to be on current status of transcendental TME for rectal cancer. These are my disclosures which are not relevant to this talk. So before we talk about the current status of TATME, I want to remind the audience of the history of TATME. You've already heard some great uh, talks on the implementation of TME. Uh, and the origin of TME, it's important to understand that the technique of TATME using transdermal endoscopic platforms has been uh, carefully studied and evaluated since 2007. It's really uh, now, uh, we're 13 years into uh, the first demonstration of the safety and feasibility in the cadaver model and then swine uh, non-survival and survival models. We're going back to the cadaver model to demonstrate the feasibility of this approach using a notes approach or a hybrid approach using abdominal uh, assistance. But ultimately, this is this body of work that really helps support the safety and feasibility of moving back to the clinical application and essentially uh, demonstrating the safety and feasibility of this approach in the setting of a first pilot case in 2009. Then uh, with uh, close international collaborations, we're able to really move the field forward very quickly and accelerate development of this technique. We had several case reports that were published thereafter. And then eventually we're able to uh, assemble, uh, you know, pilot studies uh, across the world, really investigating the early feasibility and safety of this approach. So where are we now? This is, as I said, 13 years later, clearly we have made a significant amount of progress. I mean, the amount of progress done over the past decade is nothing short of remarkable. So thanks to this inter international collaborations, we have this LORIC TATME registry, which is quite vibrant and quite rigorous in terms of the data collected so far. Uh, over 5,000 cases, if not more, entered. Um, many publications and meta-analysis already uh, looking at early outcomes of transcendental TME. Significant amount of international collaboratives really looking, pulling our forces and resources together to really uh, accelerate um, the um, evaluation of this approach. 
I think we can all agree that one of the take home message so far, the biggest impact of TATME has been the impact on conversion. We've seen a significant decrease in conversion rates compared to uh, conversion rates seen with laparoscopy or even robotic TME. And the impact on sphincter preservation also has been quite uh, remarkable. Clearly, the technique of intrasphincter resection had been already well described. Uh, Gerald Marx and uh, Eric Rullier and his group had been describing the safety of TATA and transit of um, transdental intrasphincter dissection for low rectal tumors for preservation of the sphincter. And really, what TAT has done has been able to really propel this to the next realm to be able to perform intrasphincter res resection uh, using an, a transdental endoscopic approach or even. Uh, continue this intrasphincter resection towards a TME plane and continue this TME dissection uh, using a pure transdental uh, endoscopic approach. And this really has been a very uh, fruitful collaboration of techniques and, and, and intertwining different strategies uh, to be able to complete this procedure in a minimally invasive fashion and, and taking advantage of the, um, of the transdental endoscopic approach. We can all agree this is where TATME shines the most. So for us, especially in North America, where morbid obesity rates are continuing to rise, uh, for those patients coming in with low rectal tumors, you anticipate a very narrow pelvis, very difficult to navigate, visceral obesity, and this is where transdental TME to complete the most difficult part of the TME uh, can be a, a game changer. Uh, so this is what we're talking about, very low rectal tumors that are abutting the inner rectal ring, extending all the way to the dentate line. You can combine it with your intrasphincter resection. Uh, the advantage is that you have your transdental endoscopic platform uh, in line with your rectum and mesorectum. You start your dissection under visualization, identifying your landmarks uh, uh, quite easily using a transdental approach, and that, that really facilitates um, the performance of a, a beautiful TME. Uh, once you've mastered those planes and the dissection techniques, this is what you can achieve using this approach. So very uh, helpful to navigate those complex planes. So where does TATME fall into our armamentarium for as rectal cancer surgeons? This is really where TATME shines. This is where we use it the most for low rectal tumors uh, within the five centimeter of the, um, of the rectum or mid rectal tumors, especially in obese patients. You can use it for upper rectal tumors, but frankly, the, for the majority of the cases, that is not really needed unless you're dealing with, again, a, a, a morbidly obese patient. And again, demonstrating the main advantage has been conversion rates. It's significantly lower than 10% across the board, even in, within surgeons. Um, surgeons are, are adopting it, so early in their learning curve are still able to maintain these very uh, low conversion rates across the board. Uh, the other uh, useful application has been navigating the difficult pelvis, especially the radiated pelvis or recurrent cases, using the transdental approach and combining it with the abdominal approach has also facilitated sphincter preservation and, and dealing with very difficult cases. Uh, we've also learned tremendous amounts about TATME over the past 10 years, especially the most dreaded complication of TME, of TATME being a urethral injury. We have collected our ex of experience around the world and really being able to outline the mechanism leading to this injury using video-based review and understanding that this injury occurs early during the surgeon's learning curve and also can be related to patient selection. We've learned about the rectal urethral muscle, a critical structure to understand uh, as a cl critical landmark during your low dissection. For those low rectal tumors, you have to divide this muscle close to the rectal wall to avoid injury to the urethra. Um, the technique of TATME has evolved. So from learning all, uh, all these uh, about these landmarks, we've really understood uh, how to best set yourself up for the best results with TATME. So if your tumor is quite high, you know, higher than the interrectal reverge, the dissection is usually pretty straightforward. Once you place your purse string, you enter the plane a full thickness pretty easily. Things get more complicated, obviously, when you have a tumor that is abutting the interrectal uh, ring, where you have to do a little bit of intrasphincter resection, which you can actually complete endoscopically quite nicely, especially if you know the anatomy and you're comfortable with those plane of dissection. Uh, you can actually enter the intrasphincter plane and continue your dissection towards a TME plane. And if you have a very low rectal tumor, obviously, we usually recommend, especially for the um, you know, the surgeons along the learning curve, that you do this intersphincter dissection using a standard transdental approach, so using your lone star or inner scope of your choice, start that identifying the intersphincter plane, start your intersphincter dissection and close your inner rectal stump. And then you can place your platform of your choice and do the rest of the dissection or the TME dissection using an endoscopic approach. Um, the other thing that's really remarkable has been the fact that with TATME, you can titrate the depth of your dissection uh, very meticulously. So here, the conventional dissection would call for you to stay above the endopelvic fascia to avoid injury um, to the prehypogastric nerves. But if you have a threatened mesorectal uh, margin, if you're really worried and you want to go a little deeper, you can actually titrate the depth of your dissection very, very elegantly and very precisely using the endoscopic approach. 
And then uh, uh, we mentioned the fact that in a, in a very hostile pelvis, so this is a patient who's nine months after radiation who had received TNT, and you can see here uh, the planes are really uh, fibrotic, much, much less pliable than in a case like this where everything is just fused and rock solid. And using the transdental uh, endoscopic approach, especially when you've gained that experience and you really are comfortable with your landmarks, can facilitate um, this dissection quite a bit because, again, you see very well the, the, the view is excellent. Um, and it gives you uh, some uh, great advantage in terms of viewpoint uh, to, these, to, to these tissue planes. And ov obviously the dissection is quite meticulous, but it, it gives you a, a, a heads up in terms of dissecting those complex cases. You can see here, we finally identified the back of the prostate, the very difficult planes to identify, but the transdental approach definitely facilitated this dissection. So overall, uh, we've moved away from just restricting this, these dissections to T1, T3 tumors with negative uh, margins predicted on MRI and no sphincter preservation, uh, no sphincter involvement, to now really tackling pretty much all types of tumors, especially the ones that have responded well to chemo radiation, and even some surgeons uh, using the transdental approach to do pelvic exoneration. Uh, there's really few strict contraindications. We usually recommend uh, to stay away from cases with prostate seeds, prostate cancer seeds, prior prostatectomy can make the dissection very very difficult and can expose the urethra to injury. So early in your learning curve, these are cases that we would recommend against uh, for, the, uh, for the surgeon uh, implementing it. What about the outcomes of TATME? We obviously, we are very focused on this right now. These are the results from the largest series published to date, including the, the international registry. And you can see again, the point is <laughs> the conversion rate is remarkably low. So zero to 5.6% in those larger series, uh, exceedingly low. If you think about the RCTs, Collar 2 trial, LACAR trial, Roller trial, uh, very, very low. Um, the morbidity is what you would expect from any TME, uh, you know, as high as 55% for um, um, minor complications primarily, um, mortality also well under 3%. And then the anatomic leak rate ranges pretty widely from 5% all the way to 17%. Some of it uh, really based on the learning curve, but some of it also based on whether or not the early versus delayed anatomic complications are being captured um, in those studies. Uh, but overall, uh, what you would uh, otherwise expect for the majority of those studies. And again, the, the conversion rate is, is, is really the, 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 the most salient point and the, distinctive, the distinguishing factor uh, for transcendental TME compared to uh, robotic or even laparoscopic TME. What about early oncologic outcomes? Uh, quite reassuring as well. So the TME grade has been overall quite good, ranging from 89 to 100%. CRM positive rate uh, uh, ranging from 0.6 all the way to 12.7%. So there's one outlier here in this study, but for the most part, well under 10%. And then your, your positive distal uh, resection margin also uh, quite low, uh, 2% um, to 5% at, at, its, at its peak in this particular study. The long-term oncology outcomes are still pending. We're starting to now enter um, the 52 months uh, period for follow-ups of three years, approaching uh, slowly approaching five years. But very important, uh, clearly we're focused on local recurrence. This is the big hot topic right now for transcendental TME because of this one study from Norway and the one from the Netherlands that showed much higher rates that would be anticipated for uh, TME for resectable tumors of 7.9 to 10%. Taking those two, oh, you know, ignoring those two studies, you can see the rest of the studies showed pretty reassuring rates ranging from two to uh, 6%. Um, so very, very good and compatible with what you would expect uh, after laparoscopic or robotic TME. This really, these two studies raise the alarm, and I will go into the details of these studies and why, obviously, we're very focused on understanding uh, how this happened and making sure it doesn't uh, continue, that trend is not reproduced elsewhere. Distal recurrence rate is what you would expect also, with the exception of this one study where the distant uh, recurrence was higher than, than expected. So speaking of the Norway study, this was a study that was confirmed based on an audit of stage one to three rectal cancers that underwent TATME uh, over a four year period. The procedures were all performed by um, um, surgeons uh, from four hospitals, so pretty concentrated experience. And they compared the results to uh, over a thousand cases from the National uh, Cancer Registry that were matched for T end stage and distance from the anal verge. This was the alarming fact. They identified 12 local recurrences occurring uh, at a median of 9.5 months, so 8% recurrence almost. These um, recurrences, a lot of them were multifocal, so along the pelvic side wall, really difficult to, to, to deal with. Um, you could see a, a significant a rate of positive uh, circumferential margin was identified in the study, which could be a reflection of the learning curve. But interestingly, uh, the majority of those cases uh, of recurrences occurred in cases that had negative uh, recession margin. So you can't really uh, correlate them uh, as clearly. Leak rate also was not particularly high. 
So, uh, but overall, the local recurrence rates, rates exceeded the predicted rates that you would find expect from a national cohort uh, for for staged uh, for matched tumors. So, this is clearly alarming. A lot of hypotheses as to why this happened are related to technique, um, the potential for purse string um, not being tight enough, and, and leakage of tumor cells into the pelvic side into the pelvic um, uh, cavity, leading to potential seeding of the pelvic side wall. So, that's been one theory, although it's not proven. This is um, something that we actually are very interested in, what, whether or not this could be mitigated by better closure, suture uh, closure of the anorectal uh, stump. And then the study from the, Net from the Netherlands looked at the early learning curve of the first 10 cases across 12 hospitals that had just been trained in TATME, just proctored, the same thing. They found over the 10 cases that were performed, a 10% recurrence rate overall um, of local recurrence. Eight of them were multifocal, which is obviously very concerning. This was actually associated with a leak rate of 17%, so clearly related to the learning curve and technique. And you can see all the other um, risk factors besides uh, pelvic sepsis, uh, a positive CRM was a correlate, a positive nodes and T3 disease, so more advanced disease uh, associated with, with complications during surgery, so difficult cases with um, increased leak rate. So clearly something that really points towards a learning curve and something that potentially can be um, uh, resolved with more experience. Speaking of the learning curve, these two studies are actually quite interesting. You can see this one reviewed um, four centers with more than 41 cases and clearly correlated the incidence of local recurrence with uh, experience. So uh, the first 10 procedures, highest local recurrence rate, and as the centers started to gain more and more experience, these recurrences started to wash out. Um, so these are the kind of phenomenon that you know, is un under significant scrutiny for TATME. It wasn't under as much scrutiny uh, for, for robotic TME or for laparoscopic TME. Uh, I'm sure you would have probably found the same trend, uh, but I think because TATME is being observed and monitored so closely, this is when you actually pick up the impact of the learning curve on increased risk of oncologic worse outcomes. So clearly very important, and we need to stay focused on these results and understand the impact of the of implementation and the learning curve on, on results and outcomes. Another study that here correlated a local recurrence rate to the volume. So the centers with the lowest volume had the highest local recurrence rates, even when they were matched for um, stage by stage, stage of the tumors and tumor height, same thing. Um, on the other hand, high volume centers have the lowest uh, risk of local recurrence. And again, this is really important to uh, keep in mind of when, as you look at the impact of the learning curve at sites that are implementing these uh, procedures. So the conclusion, some of, of the societies are taking the stance of pausing and reflecting on how to best implement and, and, and perform these procedures. Clearly, proctoring is essential, audit, registry, monitoring your results. High volume is necessary. You need to have a transdental expert at your site performing all these transdental resections to gain that experience and overcome the learning curve. And clearly, uh, certain patients have to be aware of these potential risks, especially urethral injury and this question of pelvic side recurrences. Um, we need to really inform our patients when they make those decisions, if, especially if they're not part of a clinical trial. And that's really important. So where do we go from here? We were very excited about THME. We have been um, advocating uh, strict uh, structured training and implementation under proctorship, but obviously for those surgeons who may not have followed that particular framework, you know, uh, there's some concern. And so we're really trying to um, uh, confirm and, and re-emphasize the importance of doing um, of doing this under protocol, of really focusing on training and proctorship and audits and registries, and of course, participating in trials so we can really continue to collect that data very carefully and analyzing it very carefully. So around the world, we're continuing the work, the hard work of clinical trials. We have several phase two and phase three trials underway, um, continued our um, intense uh, international collaborations to try to get those results quickly so we can really understand it. In the US um, and Canada, we have been running a, a phase two trial, which is uh, almost 90% accrued now. Nine sites are still actively enrolling despite COVID. Uh, so doing quite well. And clearly this will be very important to really understand the safety and feasibility of this approach among a cohort of surgeons that were trained around the same time and really followed the same uh, recommendations in terms of implementation. And we're looking at morbidity, but most importantly, the TME grade, three-year oncologic uh, outcomes and functional outcomes. We have several randomized controlled trials. As you know, these will take some time to deliver results. Until then, thankfully, we do have those phase two trials that will be coming to fruition soon. And then finally, I just want to point out the whole issue of conversion rate, which is still controversial. Um, uh, we're starting to investigate that more closely. This is a quick pilot we're doing in the US um, that is sponsored by ASCRS among four sites. We're looking specifically at conversion rates, comparing uh, laparoscopic, I mean, I'm sorry, comparing 
transitional TME to robotic TME for very low rectal tumors. So lo tumors located within six centimeters from the anal verge. And so we hypothesize it would be uh, higher in the robotic cohort, but um, time will tell what the results uh, look like. We're also obviously looking at perioperative outcomes, TME quality, uh, functional outcomes, and, and oncologic outcomes. Um, so this is the kind of um, um, uh, interesting questions that remain among experts, and especially as we uh, start to uh, counsel our residents and trainees as to what they should be focusing their training on, whether they should be focusing on uh, honing on their robotic skills or uh, starting to develop expertise in transitional TME under the proctorship of experts. This is a big question. I think one of those, these trials will help answer one of those questions as to is one superior to the other in terms of conversion rates. So Tom will tell um, which approach is the, um, is the one to invest most of your effort in um, moving forward. Thank you. And I look forward to a, a vibrant uh, discussion. Thank you for, your, uh, for listening. There's one more talk, right? Oh, what a nice talk. Thank you very much, uh, all the speakers, uh, the Joe Marx, uh, Professor O, and uh, Patricia Schiller. So do we have any, uh, actually we do not have any questions from the audience, but uh, after three talks, we can make some discussion together. So, Dr. Dr. Feldman, do we have any questions or concerns, comments? Yeah. Well, I think that all the talks were, were fantastic. It's a great um, review of the history and where we are now. I think actually Dr. Silla had a talk, had a question uh, for Professor O uh, about uh, local recurrence rates from the study that was mentioned for, um, at about uh, two or three years. So maybe we can start with that uh, question. Dr. Ho, I was impressed with your results. Congratulations on these results from Korea. My, my question was, you described a 13% um, mm. positive rate of CRM, but your mm. local recurrence rate was quite low. Yeah. So compared to that study from Norway, what, what do you think is contributing to the local recurrence? So if it's not a CRM, what do you think is the biggest uh, contributor to this local recurrence? Um, actually, I don't know. <laughs> However, I remember the clash trial, I have old trial, that shows also very high rate of uh, CRM, but it, it is not resulted in uh, high local recurrence. I think the um, CRM is a very, very important high risk factor for local recurrence, but you know, the very low rate, there is no major rectum. Only um, uh, rectal tube. But grossly, uh, I think it isn't, there is no tumor invasion. So I think the definition of CRM is adjusted or changed in that area. Anyway, our local recurrence rate is uh, around 3%. Okay? My study includes very low rectal cancer. In most of cases, around half of cases, uh, low rectal cancer. And even include the CT4, uh, no, no, T4 cancer also. So uh, our uh, CRM particularly is high, but uh, I think RGL rate is uh, very high, around 95%. So, um, you know, the Anakat trial, uh, the definition of CRM is not just the CRM one millimeters. Our data include one millimeter CRM. If we exclude the one millimeter case, the CR meter uh, drop one half, uh, drop half. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, I would agree with you. I think that's an excellent point, and we have to have some kind of measure. But there's a fundamental difference between having a positive CRM and having a cancer that is within one millimeter of the embryologic package of the rectum which is what we see in the low rectum, one will have a high cancer recurrence rate and the other will not. And, you know, Pat, as you alluded to, I think clearly the issue the Norwegians had has to do with a problem closing the lumen uh, and having the spillage of tumor cells into the field. And I found it very interesting, uh, Jaywan, is that 
when you were measuring the uh, CEA uh, post-operatively, how that went up in, patient, in a patient who had a, uh, a spillage. But I think that's going to be clearly what the mechanism is. Just as in the very beginning, when people were not protecting the wounds during laparoscopy, we had a high incidence of uh, wound in, uh, cancer and cancers implanted in the wounds. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I would ask the one question to Patricia, Dr. Dr. Patricia. I, I heard that you have uh, experience in the new robotic, uh, new robotic model. Do you have any experience of the oh. new, new robotic flexible model for the trans yeah. So the, the only robot I have worked with is, is a really a, a version that is not as sophisticated as the SP version. It's the med robotics platform, which is not a, a, a complete robotic platform. It's a hybrid platform. Only the camera is robotic, but the instruments are hand activated. And I'll be, I'll be honest, it was disappointing. I think if we're going to have significant improvement and use robotic technology, you have to have a completely robotized platform like the SP platform. And I, I don't have the experience with SP. I'm relying on, on, on uh, John Marks to share that experience and train us in that, in that approach soon, hopefully. I see. <laughs> so actually John Marks, you started the SP KTME. So what's your suggestion? So we, we are using more and more SP platform for the TATME in the future? You know, you know there are uh, some limitations in terms of the deployment of the arms and the uh, inability to have suction um, mm -hmm. available that's robotic. That being said, clearly uh, the manipulation and the dexterity within the pelvic cavity transanally is much improved with the SP robot. Uh, you have the dexterity and to have a third arm in there makes the whole experience much easier to do. I think that clearly it's going to be something that we will all like to and enjoy using uh, much more as things become available. And, and just as we got the vessel sealer and the suction and the stapler in delay for the XI, I think we'll get the same thing for the SP soon enough. So um, I think it's, I've been very happy with it. I, I've had no, it's, it's only been, it's better. The image is incredible. It's great to be able to handle everything yourself. You know, it's able to be able to, it's nice to be able to move uh, the camera to where you wish it to be. Um, guys, so what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, it's just, I never tried transanal uh, SP, but the SP is quite uh, difficult to uh, to apply to KTM because of the uh, the the length of the tip at the ac action uh, wrist is uh, quite you know longer than the XI system, so it is quite difficult to uh, deploy into the anal canal, deployed all the arms into the anal canal because the anal canal is so small. It looks like a parallel. It doesn't make any, uh, you know, uh, dexterity improvement. So I don't know how to uh, use that the SP system for TATME. You know, I, I, I've seen uh, many times in your videos, but I cannot, you know, be convinced to use SP for the TATB. He will, he will have to come visit. No, I think, uh, <laughs> honestly, that's a, that's a port issue uh, mm -hmm. for sure because the arms start like this. Yeah. And you have to be able to bend out like that to use the wrist. There are solutions to it, but uh, this is a work in progress. But I think I find it very uh, helpful and very interesting to use. And I think Others will too, as uh, they have more exposure. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, because of the time limit, uh, we better move to the next talk. I think the next talk is the current status of the robotic surgery in rectal cancer treatment.
Dr. Prof, uh, Professor Gyusok Che will give us a talk. Please play the video. I would like to thank organizing, organizing committee of KCL's for kind invitation and the international speakers, Dr. John Marx and Pat Schiller for joining this session together. It is a great honor to share our institutional experience of robotic approach to rectal cancer treatment with all of you. No disclosures. First of all, I'd like to show, show you the short-term result of our first randomized clinical trial to compare the robot versus laparoscopy for rectal cancer in collaboration with three institutions and five expert surgeons in Korea. Unfortunately, this study terminated prematurely due to delayed recruitment of patients. So finally, 151 patients for robotic group and 144 patients for laparoscopic group were allocated. Patient demography showed no differences in both groups. However, tumor location is a little lower in the robotic group even after randomization. Regarding pathologic findings, our primary endpoint of completeness of TME was similar in both groups. Also, CRM positivity was the same. Morbidity rate was similar and no mortality in both groups. Global quality of life and the bowel function were also similar between the two groups. IIEF score for male patient and the voiding function for both genders were almost identical in both groups. Another multicenter study for ISR was carried out. We concluded that robotic and the laparoscopic ISR demonstrated similar oncologic outcomes. However, estimated blood loss was less in the robotic group and the stomach free rate at the last follow was higher in the robotic group. Also, hospital stay was shorter in the robotic group too. Regarding morbidity, Overall morbidity rate was significantly less in the robotic group, especially anosmosis-related complications and the urinary discomfort was marginally less frequent in the robotic group, however, statistically not significant. As our, our own study published recently, case-matched comparison with the robot versus laparoscopic surgery for middle and low rectal cancer demonstrated that the similar long-term oncologic result. But in, in a subset of poor responders to neoadjuvant CCLT, robotic approach might provide better result with a less uh, distant metastasis rate. And we compared 118 cases in each group with a propensity score matching system. These are results. Five-year relapse free survival was acceptable and similar in both groups. And five-year local recurrence rate was also similar between the two groups. Distant metastasis occurred 10% of patients in both groups. And 
We try to identify risk factors for relapse pre survival. As a result, preoperative CCLT and the pathologic T3 and T4 and N2 group were important risk factors affecting relapse pre survival. Very interestingly, in the subgroup of combination of CCLT and the pathologic T3 and T4, which means poor responders to neoadjuvant CCLT, distant metastasis was a significantly less in the robotic group compared to the laparoscopic surgery group. This graph shows the same result. And also, we investigated long-term results of total mesorectal excision plus lateral pelvic node dissection in selective patient. And we compared robotic approach versus laparoscopic approaches. Twenty-nine cases in laparoscopy and seventy cases in robotic group show the similar patient characteristics. Operation time was 30 minutes longer in robotic group, but in resumption of oral intake and hospital stay were shorter in robotic group compared to the laparoscopic group. Five-year disease-free survival looks better in the robotic group, but statistically not significant. However, five-year overall survival was significantly better in the robotic group, but this is not clear whether this benefit came from robotic approach for TME or lateral load dissection or both. In summary, overall outcomes of robot versus laparoscopy are similar, but in selected patients with lower irradiated rectal cancer and lateral pelvic node enlargement group, robot may provide better results. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to share our recent clinical application of a Da Vinci SP platform to rectal cancer treatment. As a SP stands for single port, the size of incision matters in the minimally invasive surgery. For example, affecting postoperative pain and recovery. More importantly, this new platform is the only system which can facilitate single docking, totally robotic multi quadrant surgery. And also, we can appreciate fidelity of precision of a robotic surgery as well. But there are several considerations you should take. The position of the entry port is very important, and there are not many instruments available as they are for XI system. So you have to choose the best instrument among them, and SP robot has no stapler, no advanced energy devices such as bezel sealer or harmonic scalpel. So it is mandatory to have a plan how to do and what to do in case you need them. Consequently, assistance role becomes more important than any other approaches. And we selected entry port at, at the right low quadrant because your target organ is evenly distributed on the left side at the pelvis. Important things you have to remember is that you can do multi quadrant surgery with a single docking, but range of motion of SP system is limited, so you need to relocate 
SP system multiple times during the surgery. For example, spring, after spring pressure takedown, you have to uh, relocate again for the middle to lateral dissection of the descending and sigmoid, and finally relocate again for the pelvic mobilization. The assistant can share thermal port in anterior port. We use Korean uniport for stapling and suction and retraction. Also, we put additional 5 mm laparoscopic port at the right upper quadrant traction for traction of the colon and lactum. After completion of surgery, we can remove the specimen through this incision and the ileostom can be created to the same site. That's the reason why we selected anterior port at the right row quadrant. This is port setup as described previously. SP port has four sectors. We introduced the camera on the bottom sector, while round tooth retractor on the top, and for my left hand, bipolar forceps and monopolar seizures for my right hand. SP instrument has a dual articulations, so you may easily misunderstand that. They are more precisely operating. Unfortunately, this is not true because the action segment is longer than the excise system, which needs more space to move. And also, SP has a longer minimum distance to the target. So more precise movement in narrow space can be achieved by excise system than the SP system instead. So there are no available robotic staplers, vessel sealers, or suction irrigators. All these are critical limitations of SP system at the moment. We make a small incision at the right row quadrant and introduce the uniport through it to engage the robotic port to the system. For keeping minimum distance to target, placing the port in the air, not into the abdomen, is important for initial IMA ligation, as you can see here. The tip of troca is located in the air, not into the abdominal cavity. We can easily isolate IMA and divide it while round tooth retractor lift mesocolon upward. After division of IMB, you can enter the lesser sac over the pancreas. Then we can complete medial to lateral dissection followed by release of lateral peritoneal attachment to complete sprain fracture takedown. Then we relocate the system toward the pelvis. For rectal mobilization, Key technical tip is how to use round tooth retractor 
for appropriate traction and counteraction. As you can see, we can use the round tooth retractor as a literally retractors, not the graspers. After full mobilization of the lectum, the lectum can be divided by power the stapler. We can do lateral pelvic node dissection when affected lymph nodes are on the left side. As you can see here, it is quite similar maneuver. We can dissect the, the plane between the pelvic wall and the, uh, the lateral pelvic uh, lymph node compartment. We can preserve the obturator nerve and some important vessels, but we have to clear all the parallel tissues from the vessels and the neural tissues. This is the final picture after surgery. You can only see the protecting uh, ileostomy and uh, drain. Smaller incision and the totally robotic approach are advantages of SP system, but there are many limitations as well. We have to remember. So far, we experienced the various surgeries with some combined multi-organ resections such as hepatectomy and gastrectomy and lateral pelvic node resection with combination of colorectal resection. We hope to update our result as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, okay. uh, well, that, that, Go ahead. That's good. Uh, amazing, amazing videos. I think we have uh, we'll have time for maybe one question, um, which will be for anyone on the panel. Maybe to describe. We heard about issues with a learning curve uh, in some of the previous talks, and we also uh, heard uh, about some of the limitations in some of these really advanced technologies. So maybe we can hear from our presenters what they would recommend in terms of the best way to, uh, to, to learn these techniques safely. Are there, um, you know, we heard proctoring wasn't even perfect in, um, in, in Norway and the Netherlands, despite proctoring, there were still, uh, there were still issues. So, how should people uh, safely learn these techniques? It's quite important issue. So we, we, we published a couple of, year, couple of years ago for the learning curve, but the, there is no actually the best way to learn, but just uh, to remember the, uh, to try to embryologic uh, the, the anatomically uh, where uh, uh, de defined surgery is the best way to keep the uh, the quality of surgery. But 
the uh, the robot robotic system is is like an interface between the the surgeons uh, and the patient. So the first of all, you have to understand the mechanism of the robots. So the to keep the uh, operating field with the uh, three available instrument is the best way to uh, improve the, the robotic surgery. Even this laparoscopy and open surgery, you know, keep the, uh, the operating field is the, is the best way. So what I have tried to, to improve my uh, surgery is to develop the technique to uh, make uh, the visual field clear than any other approaches. So in that point, the robot is the best way for me for the lactal mobilization because there are three instruments on my hands I can manipulate and to keep the, all the, uh, the visual field clear. Okay, thank you. I think for TME, it's a real challenge. Um, you know, there's not really a really good learning platform. I think the best one I've seen so far was the what I call the Ito box. This sort of like, you know, uh, embedded model of the rectum and the mesorectum where Professor Ito Masaki from Japan had the very skillfully embedded landmarks where you could actually dissect through the foam, the material, and identify, you kind of replicated the urethra um, and, um, you know, the, the non-bilis fascia. And so all those landmarks were embedded and model, but you know it's going to be very difficult because it's it's every case is different, you know, and every case, you know, is especially based on where the tumor is and the male female anatomy, the degree of radiation. There's so many variables which makes the learning curve really quite long. So we we are big fans of the proctoring model. It's really having a proctor not just for your first case or two, but sort of having a mentor in a, in, a, in your institution, sort of having a, a you know a, 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 a a surgeon advocate would be monitoring and mentoring you for more than you know at least the first 10 cases and would give you feedback on your video review so video based assessment type of uh, feedback um, for your for your subsequent cases it's hard to implement but i think you know if you recognize the fact that you don't need three transdental surgeons at an institution you just need one and that one surgeon should be the one doing all the cases and the helping you know feed that volume to that surgeon so he or she can overcome their learning curve and get there quicker okay and i think that's probably a really good point about learning any new technique um this is a brand new you know technique but we've heard it evolved from earlier techniques but the idea of recording everything and reviewing it uh and getting that coaching uh, are, are really such, I think, such important concepts that are increasingly understood to be important, not just for when you're in training, but when you're trying to learn something new in practice. Leanne, okay, I, well, I, I think, I might add yep, that I yeah, think, John, go ahead. I think with the adoption of new technology, the surgeon has to understand the goal is to do the operation as well as possible in their individual hands not in what they've read and not trying to just get something done. And you also don't have to do 100% of something the first time you do it. So you have to make sure that you can implement something in a safe fashion for your patient. And these techniques that have been spoken about in terms of mentoring and proctoring and courses are all great in that regard. But the end result is in your operating room, you have a responsibility for that individual patient. And sometimes you can maybe do two parts or three parts of the operation the way you want to, but over time, you'll be able to implement it safely. Good. Yeah. Can I have a question to uh, John? <laughs> okay. Uh, John? Save time, I'm okay. Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The floor okay. is fair. It's fair. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, we, we better close the this session. All and right. We All right. Use the Zoom meeting. Good. So, okay. We can discuss together. So okay, yeah, because of time limit, I think the Dr. Dr. Fredman, please close the session. Yes. So thank you. I think there were four wonderful talks from really innovative leaders in this area. 
Uh, all of them were excellent and excellent discussion as well. So uh, thank you uh, on behalf of Sages. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was uh, great to have uh, another very successful Case Sales and Sages session. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you for joining us. Bye.